interpreting it the other way. All right, thank goodness there's always more than one way to do things when you're on tech, right? So good. Thank you for being with me today. We've got Kylie with us on Facebook. Hello, Kylie. And we've got Brenda with us on the webinar. And there will be more people joining us on Instagram and in various other platforms. So good to have you with us. <clears throat> Excuse me. I know there's probably a million other things you could be doing right now. So I am really thankful that you have decided to join me today. I should have filled my water bottle before we started. This could be an interesting 45 minutes. I appreciate that you want to learn some iridology to update your skills, or maybe you're new to iridology and you want to have a peek behind the curtain to learn a little bit about it. So this is great to have you with us. I hope that by the end of our time together today, you'll have a little more clarity about some, some different things about iridology. You know, iridology has been evolving for nearly 200 years. And in that time, there's been a lot of changes and a lot of research. Some of us like to keep up to date and keep current, and some iridologists don't, which is kind of sad because, you know, when we're using old information, it may not be as accurate as the newer research information that is out there. So today we are going to be looking at some of that newer information. In, and by newer, I mean the last 30 to 40 years. That doesn't seem very new, but there are people who are still practicing things that are 50 and 60 years old. So let's bring people up to date here. So I'm glad you are with us. Remember, as we're doing this little discussion on the verbiage or the language of iridology, that iridology is an unlicensed, unregulated profession in most of the world. Now, that is not true in Germany and Russia, for sure, where you have to be a licensed medical practitioner or in Germany, a chiropractor in order to do iridology. So most of us in North America are herbalists or nutritionists or naturopaths or, um, you know, we, maybe we're medical people who have transitioned to a more holistic profile. And um, because of that, we, we really want to avoid using any form of language that could be construed as diagnosis. And we need to avoid doing prescriptive things as well, although we can recommend. You will notice as we go through today's presentation that most of the older language is very diagnostic in nature. The newer, the newer language is more descriptive in nature. And much of our newer language is also in line, completely in line with um, with proper ophthalmological, there will be a spelling test, so I hope you know how to spell that, ophthalmological terminology, right? And what we are doing is we are simply um, adding depth to the understanding of what that means. In today's webinar, as always, we're going to be covering a tiny bit of the content from the Dynamic Iridology Assessment System for Health Professionals. You'll get a glimpse as to how this style of iridology can work in your clinical practice and how it can save you time when you are with your clients, but how it can also add value to the work you do with your clients. So do up your seatbelt. We're going to be moving pretty fast here. I'm just going to put a little commercial in right here. Tuck this into the back of your brain. Our next full course starts on January 12th, 2023. Enrollment is open now, but it is limited to only 10 students. And so, you know, if, um, if you are interested in enrolling in the course, we probably should talk sooner rather than later to give you all the, the details. Now, if you are ready, if you're quite finished fooling around out there, now if you're ready, would you, uh, to look at some eyes, drop a heart or give me the word heart in the comments. Let me know that you are ready. We've got Aquila joining us on Instagram. So good to see you, Aquila. She's, uh, I'm seeing names that I'm very familiar with, people that I've maybe had conversations with already or that have been with me on many webinars. So thank you for being here. And we've got hearts coming in. This is great. Thank you so much. You will find that the more you interact with me, 
the more comments you drop, the more questions you ask, the more you're going to get out of me. Seriously, that's the way to pump me for information is to just really show me you've got a pulse this morning and that you're paying attention. And I will, I will give you lots of information. So for now, if you're ready to learn some of the modern terms and how they compare to the older terms, we are ready to get going because I got some love there. Be sure to post your comments and questions in the comments box, and I will do my best to get those answered as we're rolling. Alrighty, this is not meant to be a passive educational experience. It's meant to be an active educational experience. So get active with me here. Alrighty, so the first word we want to talk about is the word lesion. Lesion is the old word, lacuna is the new word. Now you're going to see if you've been to any other websites, if you've been on anybody else's classes, that a lot of people are still using the old language. Lesion is the old word, lacuna is the new word. And when we look at the old words, they are often, again, very diagnostic. And most of us are not legally allowed to do that. So we're not going to go that direction here. When we look at the de definition of a lesion, it is a region or organ or tissue which has suffered damage through injury or disease, such as a wound, ulcer, abscess, or tumor. So if you say that somebody has a lesion, you are diagnosing a problem. When we use the word lacuna, lacuna simply means an unfilled space or gap. So as we look at an iris, this is a lacuna. This is a lacuna. This is a lacuna. If you've been with me at all uh, for a couple of weeks ago, we did um, an anatomy from an iridologist perspective. So we did eye anatomy and you know the eye is made up of layers of fiber. And so when we have this layer of fiber that is separated here, we're actually looking at one layer down. Or if it's really deeply separated, we might be looking two or three layers down in the fiber structure. So a, a lacuna brings our attention to a reaction field in the iris, but it does not tell us what is inherently wrong there. Lacunae are inherited. They are passed down three to four generations. And so this is showing us that this area has had a weakness over the past three to four generations. Now, when we see this, we have to have a conversation with our client because we need to understand what this person's personal and family health history is to understand if this is significant here and now. When we have several lacunae in an eye, like we have in this eye, we've got lots of lacunae. Each of those is not necessarily important. We need to combine them and we need to understand the context. The, these lacunae, when we, when we look at this, we need to understand how they play off each other. And we need to understand again what the family history is to know how to interpret these. We're not going to assign a meaning to each and every one of these lacunae because individually they may not be important this may be a situation inherently that is resolving through the generations it's actually getting better it's getting it's having less and less impact so we need to have that conversation with the client we don't just look at an, at this and say you have this problem you have this problem you have this problem because you have this mark this mark this mark so with a lacuna we never pronounce you have this problem you have a specific problem we and we never say this particular body part needs work so for example these these two are sitting in the brain region and we would never say you know you have a problem in your brain we don't get to diagnose like that right but we could certainly ask is there a personal or family history of headaches or of any other kind of issues with the brain and i'd be very careful with how i said that because you don't want to create panic in anybody Right. I mean, if someone said, is there a personal or family history of a brain issue, wouldn't that cause a bit of panic? We don't want to do that. We want to ask our questions in such a way that we gather information without instilling panic and while educating our clients. It's a very can be a very fine line that we walk. This used to be called a sodium ring or a cholesterol ring or a sodium cholesterol ring. We now call it a lipemic diathesis. There is sometimes a bit of a correlation between this ring and hardening of the arteries and of cholesterol and even senility, but it's not a really strong correlation. The old name of sodium ring and cholesterol ring 
middle names, they were really diagnostic. Another common name for this, again, was Arcus Senilis or Arc of Senility. I know a lot of elderly people who have this and they show no signs of senility. So this is not a strong correlation to that either. The newer name of lipemic diathesis is an overarching name and it includes some, it breaks down into a few other subcategories. So it breaks down into the definition of corneal arcus, corneal annulus, corneal opacity. These terms simply describe what we are looking at that this is opaque, right? That it is an arc or an annulus, a ring going all the way around in the cornea. So the lipemic diathesis gives us clues as to the imbalances that might exist in the body and particularly imbalances to how the body works with its carbohydrates and creating its lipids, right? And it's either or and sometimes both. And so again, we need to have that conversation because this again doesn't guarantee that there is hardening of the arteries or that they're going senile. This is an indicator that forms in the cornea, not in the iris. And as such, it, it doesn't go away, right? We're not going to cleanse this out of the eye as we cleanse this person's arteries. I'm certainly not saying that we shouldn't periodically with certain clients do or, or teach them how to, to clean out their arterial system. But I'm saying that when we do that, if they have this, we're not gonna see this mark disappear. Okay, the cornea is very stingy. It's going to hold on to it. You may have seen these rings coming around and around and around in people that you work with, or you might have seen other workshops on them. You've probably heard them called nerve rings or stress rings or cramp rings. We actually don't call them that at all. We call them contraction furrows. These are not the result of stress. You're not going to make these go away by helping the person get rid of their stress. We used to say that if they had three complete rings going all the way around, they were heading into or coming out of a nervous breakdown. Pretty amazing diagnosis, right? Now we know that these are an indication that this person tends to always be ready for the next crisis. They live in the sympathetic nervous system. That's how they respond to everything. And as you know, sympathetic nervous system is fight, flight, or freeze. These contractions, I've seen it said that, you know, people say, well, these, if um, with certain images, and I don't have a good example of this in this slide deck, we do in the dynamic iridology assessment system course, but I've heard them say that these can be healed. And what they're actually referring to is not healing, it's pupil size. When the pupil is very large, it compresses the iris tissue. And as that iris tissue compresses, like an accordion, the pleats in an accordion get deeper as the accordion is compressed. That will make these contraction furrows look deeper and darker as well. When the pupil is small, the tissue stretches, just like an accordion that's being expanded. And when that expands, those folds in the accordion, those pleats in the accordion become flatter. When, they, when, con, when contraction furrows get stretched out, when they become flatter, they don't look as dark. They don't look as deep. That's not healing. That's completely to do with pupil size. So again, these rings are more pronounced when the pupil is large. They are softened when the pupil is small. What these really tell us is that this person internalizes their stress deeply, reacts to stress strongly, and probably would benefit from B vitamins, vitamin C, calcium, and magnesium on a regular basis, at the very least enhancing their diet with foods that are rich in those nutrients, but probably actually giving them supplements in that direction to help them manage their stress better, to help them not be so acutely responsive to stress. Does that make sense? If that makes sense, give me a big fat makes sense in the comments. And are there any questions? Are we doing okay? Are we doing okay? 
All righty. Thanks, Rob, for letting me know this is making sense to you. That I really appreciate your interaction there. And those of you on Instagram, go ahead and do that. I should have moved my camera closer. My apologies, Instagram people. There we go. That'll be a little bit easier for you to see what we're talking about. The next one we want to talk about is venous congestion. Can you see that there is a blue haze at the edge of the eye here, at the edge of the iris? If you can see that, give me blue in the comments box, that you can see that little bit of a haze hanging off the edge. This used to be called venous congestion. We now call it a circulatory ring. Oh, we got a blue heart there, Elaine. Thank you for that. Love that. And so, this, in my experience, does not always suggest venous congestion. It does always have to do with circulation, but not as the cause, often as an effect. I see this has a really strong correlation with the clients that I've worked with that I've seen this in. They tend to have a really, they tend to have a challenging time with their blood sugars. And so when we see blood sugars doing a roller coaster ride, we tend to see more of this blue at the edge because when the blood sugars are tanking, the body goes into stress and it closes off circulation to the extremities, right? We also, I see this a lot when in people who have tired adrenals. And again, think about what is the impact that the adrenal glands have on circulation? Right? And so when we see this, yes, it can mean circulation is not being making it to the extremities the way we would like it to. But think about why would that be happening? So this isn't necessarily venous congestion. It might be a weak, some challenge rather in the circulation for other reasons. Now, are you beginning to see how iridology can give us insights into the inherent predispositions and of a person and that it's not diagnostic? If you're beginning to see that, give me an I see in the comments box. Now that we've touched on a perfect Rob, thank you for that. I love that. I love the interaction. Now that we've touched on a few comments, uh, a few of the commonly used old terms, I'm going to take just a moment to introduce myself. And then we've got eight more terms we want to look at. All right, we've got lots to cover today. So let's dive in. My name is Judith Cobb. I am a level three IPA, oops, sorry about the Instagram, a level three IPA certified iridology instructor. IPA is a not-for-profit organization that has set standards for iridologists. And so they have a certification process that is universal within their organization all over the world. That's really, really cool. I got into holistic healing um, over four decades ago. I've been an iridologist for over four decades now because I had health problems and the medical world wasn't helping me with answers. They were actually not helping me at all. And at that time, I met someone who introduced me to a little bit of holistic healing stuff, some iridology, some herbology, some nutrition, fell in love with the guy, married him, and here we are 42 years later. But I ran with it. I loved this stuff. And it's what I decided to do with my life. Over the years, I've written many books um, and self-published them, Pregnancy Naturally, The Herbal Birth Kit Handbook, Healthy Kids Naturally, The Essential Guide to Nature Sunshine Products, Biokinesiology and Color Therapy Level 1 and 2, and The Confident, Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology Textbook. I've also designed and taught courses to go with just about all of those books, Herbology Level 1, Herbology Level 2, Biokinesiology and Color Therapy Level 1 and 2. For a while, I was a certified prenatal educator with the ICEA, loved doing that. Um, and I designed and taught prenatal classes. And of course, my love right now, and hopefully for the next many years, I've already been doing it for a good five years, is to teach a, an IPA approved iridology course uh, that we called the Dynamic Iridology Assessment System. I'm one of only five level three certified iridologists in the world, and you can go to iridologyassn.org to verify that if you feel like you need to. I am also a, uh, I have nutrition credentials that allow me to be affiliated with the Canadian Association of Holistic Nutrition Professionals and the Canadian Association of Natural Nutritional Practitioners. I am also a master herbalist, and that allows me to be a professional member of the Alberta Herbalist Association. Enough about me. Let's do some more eyes. Sound good? 
parasite lines, radii solaris. That is these black lines radiating outwards. Now, when I first learned iridology as a Jensenian iridologist, iridologist that's how I know these, these older terms and what they meant. Um, I was taught that these always meant the person had parasites. Now, I agree that many of us do have parasites and we might not even know it, right? That's just a given considering the international scope of where our food comes from. However, the iRIDES teach us about genetics, not about transient situations. Having parasites is not a genetic situation. I was not able to pass parasites to my children when I had my children. Like it's not in their genetic coding. It's not in mine either. And so the eyes don't teach us about things that are not genetic. And again, we're talking about the eye rides in this case. And so as a result, what these lines teach us is that first off, they should be called radial furrows because they are furrows that radiate outwards. They are a separation in the tissue of the, the stromal layers of the iris. And they teach us about the possibility of an interruption in the nerve feed and potentially a weak, a weak link in a specific organ but they don't say we have parasites. Drug spots. These used to be called drug spots or Sora. Now they are called pigments. Now, North Americans are cleanse happy. Would you agree? It seems to me, I'd like to know if you, I'd actually like to know if you agree with me on that. It seems to be a badge of honor to say, I'm on a cleanse or I just came off a cleanse, or I did a, you know, a six week juice fast, or, you know, where it's, we seem to be so proud of doing this, but that's like saying, I'm proud I cleaned my house because in between cleanings, I let the kids and everybody else run through my house with muddy shoes, right? Cleanse and diet happy yet the most overweight and unhealthy, LOL, says Rob. Oh, I could not agree with you more. Could not agree with you more. And so what we know about these things is, number one, you cannot cleanse them out of your eye, nor can you cleanse this other pigment, because this is also pigment, out of your eye. That is all a part of your genetics. These may be present at birth, but they may surface with time as a result of genetics, of your something in your body genetically triggering and create putting this into the eye. There's been no scientific proof that these areas that have other color in them are the result of chemical drug use, chemical exposure, or toxicity. There's also no proof that these pigments can be cleansed out of the eyes. That's, this was a turning point for me from Jensenian to constitutional. Right. I put my clients through cleanses and on very clean diets and on supplements that should have roto rooted them out, digestive tract, every orifice, every cell should have been squeaky clean and we never saw a change in their eyes. We do know that pigment can appear over time and again, it is inherent. When I have seen people post before and after pictures, proving cleansing had changed their eye color. What I see is a change in technology. They used a different camera. They used different lighting. That in and of itself is enough to nullify their results. I can show you pictures taken with the same camera on a different shutter speed, <clears throat> and it totally changes the coloration of the eye, right? People would say that, oh, yeah, you got cleansing happening. I go, no, I just changed the shutter speed, right? So it's a really important thing to be aware of. The absorption ring. All right. Can you see at the very edge of this iris, there is a gray edge. If you can see gray right there, give me the word gray in the comments. This goes for you guys on Instagram, too. Let me know if you can see this. Can you see gray there? Gray? Rob, you have lightning fast fingers. That is amazing. Well done. So that used to be called an absorption ring. 
We now call it, huh, guess what? Interpupillary border, because that is what the optometrists and ophthalmologists call it. It is an interpupillary border. This is the correct name for it. When we see it, this, when it's gray like this, it correlates to the stomach lining. And it teaches us about the stomach's inherent ability to secrete digestive juices. When it's gray, and remember the gray is inherent, they were born this way, it suggests that this person has a reduced ability to secrete digestive juices in the stomach. And with your A and P, you know that the stomach is where you secrete the acids to digest protein. So this may suggest that the person might have problems digesting protein. Now, why do I say might? Because this shows us what the body wants to do. The client's symptoms tell us what the body is doing. We need to have that conversation with our client to understand what they are doing to support their digestion. This person might be doing lots of really good things and their body doesn't want to secrete the acids very well, but because they're doing the right things, they are helping their body to do a better job of this. So they may not have symptoms. Or it might have been symptoms that caused them to make some lifestyle changes and improve their diet and maybe take the right supplements to relax when they're eating, to not drink fluids with their meals. And those things would have a positive impact. Does this make sense? If this makes sense, give me a number one in the comments box. The eyes don't tell us what is wrong. They tell us where the compromises might be inherently. And then we have that conversation with our client to understand what they're doing, what their symptoms are, and how best to work with them. Make sense? The rheumatic eye versus the febrile eye. Thanks for that thumbs up, Elaine. I appreciate that. This used to be called a rheumatic eye, where the typically, um, no, let me correct that, only found in blue eyes. And you would see that everything was very, very white and clumped together, lots of clumping together of fibers. That was a rheumatic eye. We now call this a febrile eye. Well, when you see rheumatic, what do you think of? What does that make you think of? What kinds of disease processes are you thinking you're going to be assessing here? Let me know. Fever, okay. Well, you would for febrile, not necessarily for rheumatic, right? You might find that um, rheumatic rheumatism, rheumatoid arthritis, arthritis, yeah, right? That's, that's more what the rheumatic would suggest. Febrile, though, as Rob suggested, suggests tendency towards fevering. And that's exactly what this eye suggests. So what we want to ask this client specifically is, were they prone to fevers as a child? And do they still fever easily as an adult? And Elena is saying, what about inflammation? Yeah, absolutely. So febrile is a deeper level of inflammation. We certainly see other indications of inflammation in the blue eye that are not as intense as this. So febrile is that inflammation plus one. So a deeper level, deeper level. Now, having said that, this is only about their predisposition. This is what they were born with. So these people also tend to be more prone to being mucousy. But as you already know, if these people support their digestion well, and if they make better food choices, and they're eliminating the foods that really form a lot of mucus, and, and they're you know, making sure their elimination is good, they likely will reduce their ability to be inflamed or their tendency towards being inflamed. They will reduce their tendency towards fevering. They will just do better all the way around. Make sense? We used to call this, love the thumbs up, this is so great. Um, we used to call this a weak constitution. 
Now you can see that there's a lot of gapping between the fibers, lots of open areas that have some shading in them. We used to call this a weak constitution. How would they make your day? You're off at a practitioner's office and they're doing an iris analysis. You've got a weak constitution. Now that's not going to help very many people, right? It's not very hopeful. We now call it a connective tissue subtype because what we've learned is that people who have lots of this gapping tend to have more challenges with their collagen structure and with their joints. And so we want to make sure they are properly nourished and that they are digesting their foods well to get the amino acids they need and to get all the building blocks they need to do their tissue repair effectively. That doesn't necessarily mean we're giving them a collagen supplement because some people actually cannot use collagen, right? We always want to look at food choices and we want to look at how they digest to understand how well they can repair their tissue. These kind of people, people with this structure, don't have a lot of room for cheating in their diet. They need to be pretty careful pretty much all the time. We used to call this a strong constitution. Notice the difference between this one and the previous slide. We have a lot of fiber here, relatively straight, very densely packed. But here's the trick. I want you to compare this to say a Rolls Royce, okay? Even a Rolls Royce with its German engineering and all of its guarantees and warranties can be driven into the ground and can break down if you don't do the maintenance on it. This is true of these people as well. So we, this is actually called the neurogenic subtype. And with these people, what I see commonly happen is their body is quite resistant to, resistant to disease and breakdown. But they figure when they're younger that, hey, I'm tough. I don't need to take care of myself. I can party hard. I can skip on sleep. I can live on eight cups of coffee a day and never eat solid food. I'll be just fine. And they are just fine for a length of time because their body is strong. By the time they hit about 45 or 50, that's when they show up in my office. And that's when they're saying things like, I don't understand. I've never been sick a day in my life. How come now I've got arthritis and high blood pressure? And if it's a woman, hot flashes. And if it's a guy, it's usually things like elevated cholesterol and just all kinds of things going AWOL on them. Well, it's because you didn't do your lube jobs and oil changes. Right. So these people, the neurogenic people tend to in internalize their stress a little bit. They like their world to be calm. They like to be in control of everything. But we really do need to make every effort to teach them that the earlier they start with good self-care, the longer they can enjoy good health. Rob says, sounds like Donald Trump surviving on McDonald's well into his 70s. Yeah, love to see his eyes. He probably has a strong constitution, but I'd also love to see his labs. I'd like to know if his hemoglobin A1C is okay. I'd like to know if his cholesterol and his triglycerides are okay. I'd like to see some, uh, some liver testing done to see if his liver has survived his lifestyle, right? Because I guarantee that at some point in time, he's probably going to have some problems, right? Any questions so far? I love the interaction and the comments that you're making. This is great. So you, do you teach these patterns? So do these iris patterns you're teaching help us to direct lab tests and suggest to clients with their uh, clients to discuss with their doctors? Absolutely. Absolutely. So when I see certain markings in the eyes, I will suggest to my clients that they should be having a conversation with their doctor. There's certain labs I'd like to see results for. And so they'll trot off to their doctor and usually within a month or two, they're back to me with lab tests. Right. In the meantime, I'm going to work with them based on what I see in their eyes and based on their symptoms and what they've asked for help with. I don't wait for those labs to come in. The labs just verify what I've suspected. Right. So I haven't diagnosed anything for them. I'm letting the lab tests do that. I'm letting their doctors do that. What percentage of the time are your lab tests validating your suspicions? 
mm, probably 75 to 80 percent. Yeah, it's a pretty good correlation rate, right? And that's a good thing. That's a really good thing. We used to talk about bowel pockets. We don't do that anymore. Now we talk about crypts. So when we're looking at an eye like this, we're looking at these little tiny marks that are attached, that are very dark, that are attached to the collaret. Now they can actually be anywhere in the eye, but specifically when we're talking about crypts in this way, they are attached to the inside of the collaret. We used to say that these meant this person had diverticuli. Oh, I, di I diagnosed diverticuli a lot in my early years. Oops. Now what we know, because there have been studies done using diagnostic imaging, these people don't always have those pockets. They don't always have diverticuli. In fact, they don't often have diverticuli. Elaine's saying she's done this too. Mm, guilty as charged, right? Well, we're, we fixed our ways. We mended our ways. We repented, right? Now what we know is that these suggest there is a weakness in the bowel wall and that there likely is reduced energy there. Again, remember, this is inherent. This has been passed down. So I should rephrase that. There is likely a weakness in the bowel wall and there is likely reduced energy in that area that may make it more difficult for the body to offload toxins may make it easier for the body to actually absorb toxins through the intestinal wall into the blood and lymphatic system. So again, here, we need to have that conversation about bowel habits, about bowel symptoms, about diet, about family history, because these are inherent. You know, has anyone in your family ever had an issue with their bowel, of an issue of any kind? And we would ask that particularly if we were working with someone who came in with symptoms of colitis or Crohn's or if they had alternating constipation and diarrhea or if there was blood in their stools and actually if there's blood in their stools, yeah, work with them, but send them to their doctor yesterday and get a colonoscopy to verify what you're working with, right? That's an important one. I know one young man who had blood in his stool for two years before his, and he kept going to his doctor before his doctor sent him for a colonoscopy. And um, at the colonoscopy, he was diagnosed with bowel cancer, right? Yeah, I wanted to do this to the doctor. Are you looking at the large crypts or just the small ones at 12 o'clock? I'm looking at any crypts that are attached to the inside of the cholerat because that correlates, the cholerat correlates to the intestinal tract. And depending on what part of the cholerat we're looking at, will tell us if we are looking at the bowel, the colon, or the small intestine. It'll even tell us what part of the colon or small intestine we're looking at so that we can be aware of um, symptoms there that we can work with. But again, don't mess around with something if it could be cancer. Make sure you send them back to their doctor for an accurate testing and diagnosis. And then you can certainly, if you've got the skills, work with them holistically to help them beat the cancer, if that's what your client is asking for. At the very least, you can strengthen their body so if their surgery is going to be involved or things like that, they can withstand that um, better, right? Does that all make sense? This ring coming around here used to be called the autonomic nerve wreath. You'll hear a lot of people call it the ANW or autonomic nerve wreath. Uh, ophthalmologically, it's correctly called the collarette. So that is what we call it. It is a specialized trabecula that forms as all trabeculae do during the prenatal time. It teaches us about the nervous system, specifically about the autonomic nervous system teaches us about the balance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. It gives us information, a little bit of information about their personality style as well. And it also, as you've already noted, gives us a bit of information, a fair amount of information really, about the intestinal tract from the mouth to the anus. And so um, and we're looking for things like placement. Is it close to the pupil? Is it distance from the pupil? We are looking for Things like, is it pigmented? Does it have other colors 
laid onto it. We are looking for, with that placement, do, are there places that wow out? Are there places that push in? This is never going to move. This is genetic, right? Aquila is saying, this is awesome. Thank you, Aquila. So good. It is awesome. It's really awesome because when we understand things about this, uh, is it broken in places? Is it doubled in places? Is it placed too far away? Is it placed too close? Does it have pigment? We understand so much more about how it functions. Is this a bowel that's prone to being lazy and ballooned or crampy and irritable? Is it a bowel that um, is prone to having inflammatory processes inside it? How, how prone is it to being leaky and having leaky gut? These are all things that we can see a predisposition to. And then we confirm that with our client's history, the questions we ask our client and or lab tests. And again, I'm not allowed to requisition lab tests. So I just ask my clients to go back to their doctor and get those labs done. I had one client recently where we assessed some key issues and he sent me an email after he got, after he'd seen his doctor to ask for the lab test. And he said, how come my doctor didn't know to ask for these? He said, now that we've got these lab tests in, I see there are problems that my doctor's never addressed. I was like, well, I just look at things differently. I take, you're, you're with me for an hour, not for seven and a half minutes, right? And that's a huge difference between what we do and the way many doctors operate. You might have heard of this coming around the edge. You see these cotton balls? If you see these things that look like cotton balls or clouds, give me cotton balls in the comments so I know you're seeing what I'm talking about. Cotton balls. These are, have in the past been called lymphatic rosary. And they do have a correlation to the lymphatic system. We now call this the hydrogenoid subtype because this is not just about the lymphatic system, it's about how the body uses fluids in itself. And so this is not a guarantee that this person has lymphatic issues or that the lymphatic system is congested. It suggests that the lymphatic system may want to be congested, but you know what? Okay, we call these markings specifically TOFI. And while they suggest that predisposition to lymphatic congestion, without having a conversation with my client, I don't know if they have lymphatic congestion. I can guess that if my person, my client lives a sedentary life, they probably have lymphatic congestion. But if this is someone who goes for a 30 minute brisk walk every day, they have a much lower chance of having lymphatic congestion. If this is a person who has a lot of dairy in their diet, a lot of white flour, a lot of white sugar, they probably have lymphatic congestion. If they have a really clean diet, they are reducing their risk of having lymphatic congestion. And, and you know, because you've got anatomy and physiology under your belt, all of the roles of the lymphatic system for taking nutrients in to tissues, for bringing garbage out, for its impact in the immune response. When I started learning constitutional iridology after learning Jensenian, the biggest revelation for me was that being born with excellent fiber structure, what we used to call the strong constitution and what we now call neurogenic, isn't a superhero shield. And it doesn't guarantee that a person will be healthy forever. The second biggest uh, aha I had was that people who have contraction furrows are not headed for a nervous breakdown. So, Question on, on uh, Instagram, how do you resolve the problem with sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves? That depends on the individual, right? It depends on the individual. It comes back to probably working with their foods, teaching them about nutrients they can be adding to their diet, teaching them lifestyle skills, like uh, even something as simple as going for a 30 minute walk every day, right? And so it's, not so much a problem with, it's an imbalance. And we just teach them the life skills they need to be in control, right? Such an important thing. Yeah, Elaine is saying adaptogenic herbs. Yeah, that can be very helpful. Sometimes it's nervine herbs, breathing exercises, getting them to do learn yoga or meditation or just create some kind of an active lifestyle. 
For some of them, it's journaling. Maybe they, if they live in a place where they can have a pet, and if that's something that they want to do, you know, getting a pet can sometimes be helpful. Taking up a hobby can sometimes be helpful. So it's a very individualized thing. There's so much that is on the internet and so, especially on social media that is confusing about iridology. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that? But here's what one of my students said. And uh, Elaine is saying, yep, she's noticed that. This is from Jade Brooks. She's um, one of my dynamic iridology students. And she said, this is my first iridology course. However, in my certified natural health professional course, we were given a three hour lesson on iridology in a nutshell. That lecture and the study material left me more confused than before I knew anything at all. Judith's Dias program, that's dynamic iridology, has been an incredible experience and we are just halfway through the program. Her teaching materials are thorough and easy to follow. The charts are invaluable and so insightful. I left Western medicine a while ago in favor of natural health. I've been an RN for 22 years. Western medicine wasn't able to help, uh, wasn't able to, I lost my place, help me with my health, but, I, but iridology has helped me to identify many of my health challenges and act to support my body toward better health. I have also been able to guide my family in supporting their bodies. Judith is truly amazing and is my most favorite instructor out of all my many years of higher education. Thanks, Judith. So she is still in the program. We are, she's still just over halfway through. She sent this to me just a few days ago. But um, I love the fact that she is practicing on her family and that it's helping her with them. Once she's graduated, she'll be using it with her, her clients as well. This is Sharon Bimrose. She's a naturopath from Australia and a herbalist. She's a graduate of my program. As a naturopath and herbalist, I've always used iridology in my practice. However, it was the structure and connection of the iris findings I learned in dynamic iridology that have made the biggest difference to my practice. The personality aspects of iridology, which we also touch on in Dias, have also been enormously valuable in my practice as it has enabled me to establish a far better connection with my clients and to provide more confident communication on my behalf. Dynamic iridology has certainly reduced the time required for prioritizing a treatment plan and the number of unpaid hours that could go into clients' follow-up consultations that would have otherwise been difficult to gauge without a glimpse into the body's internal processes. Without a doubt, dias has been a huge game changer in my practice. I love that. So how do we achieve those kinds of results with the dias program? What do you get? How does it work? I just need to move this screen over a tiny tad. There we go. We do this through 20 two and a quarter hour live interactive webinar classes. We teach the full IPA level one and level two core curriculum. That is the curriculum. Those two levels are what you need to become, to sit for the certification process. You receive recordings of every class for playback on demand in case you miss a class or want to go back and review. Your textbook that I've written is a 225 page full color downloadable textbook. What you need to know is every IPA instructor has to have their teaching materials vetted by IPA. Mine passed with flying colors. You get 45 pages of cheat sheets. So this is the Coles notes or Cliff notes version, the shortened, just the highlights. Every uh, twice a month, we have an office hour webinar, which is where students can bring their cases, their questions, business or iridology, anything related to the practice of iridology to office hours for us to discuss and coach them and support them. And with this, you don't get kicked out when you finish your coursework. This goes on long term and it'll go on for as long as I teach. Private social media group for students and alumni where you can again post questions and concerns or share information. I include the certification exam mentoring for my students who want to certify with IPA. IPA has a prescribed protocol that we have to follow to prepare you to sit for the exam. Many teachers charge extra for that. I include it in your tuition for up to 10 months after you complete your coursework. I hold your feet to the fire and give you a deadline to get it done. We also integrate herbal and nutritional information into the teaching. So if you already have herbs or nutrition, we're going to help you draw that in 
to your iridology practice, which then helps you to understand how to use iridology to ask the questions and to create protocols for your clients right in your client sessions. So you're not going off and doing your client protocols on your own time and then emailing those out. You are doing that while you're with your client. And we have a supportive community of iridology students and, um, and course grads in that private social media group. So this is all about the support, the education and the support that we give to help you be the best iridologist you can possibly be, All right? And my goal is that I want you to be better than I am. Seriously, that's my goal. The next course does start on January 12th and you only get into the course by talking to me. That might sound a little snooty, but you have to be a health professional. You have to have an anatomy and physiology course under your belt already because that allows us to go much, much deeper in the teaching and learning of iridology. And I want to talk to you. I want to make sure that we have chemistry. I want to make sure, whoops, that this is a really good fit for you and that um, you're going to love it, right? I didn't used to require a phone call, but over the last about six or eight months, I started requiring it so that I could make sure that this was going to be a really good fit for you. If it's not a good fit, you drop out. That affects the group dynamics. That's not good for anybody. So I want to make sure it's a good fit so that you are you will complete the course and you know go on to do great things. So again, use that URL, tinyurl.com slash dynamic dash iridology dash insight to book a call with me to talk about the course, to talk about where you're at and what you want to achieve so we can we can talk about it and help you decide whether it's a good fit for you or not. And if it is, I will offer you the opportunity to get enrolled. If it's not, I'll guide you in other ways. I'll direct you to do something different than my course, right? And so I just want the best for you. So with that, that's all I've got for you today. Are there any more questions, anything else that we should be discussing in a brief moment before I run off to teach my, my 12 o'clock class. Are we good? Are we? All righty, amazing. So again, I look forward to speaking with, with you very, very soon and have a fantastic week. Talk to you later, bye for now.